All righty. Hello, everyone. We are live from the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery for our creative conversations with the artists of SHIFT, Thinking Globally, Acting Locally, curated by Maria Seda Reader. We'll tour you through the 360 exhibition, and each artist will have about three to four minutes to share a bit about their work. So feel free to ask questions in the comments along the way, and we will get to them. Uh, Maria has graciously agreed to be the moderator for this. So before we go too much for further and I start working on the tech bit, um, also thank you for your patience if we have any lag. Um, I'm gonna hand it to Maria who will level set us and get us in the right uh, frame of mind and we'll get started. To you, Maria. Hello everyone, thanks so much for being here. I'm hoping that you're comfortable and uh, maybe eating some lunch and taking care of yourself because um, we'd like to prioritize the um, ongoing commitment to our bodies and the ongoing care and sustenance of the life that we're currently leading, that, which I think is something that is crucial perhaps to every artist in, involved in the show. Um, we are gonna spend most of this time talking to the artists. So I don't really want to prepare you too much for the exhibition. Um, suffice it to say that I think the common thread of all of these folks who are here are that they are considering, celebrating, memorializing sometimes the systems and structures that are holding us in place and asking us how we can move forward in a new way. Um, and, you know, oftentimes when there are crises is when uh, large paradigm shifts can occur. So um, we've all been in the midst of that for the past year and a half or so. Um, these artists were already working in that vein, many of them um, prior to the um, larger crisis of COVID, um, but I think that it's also um, sort of forced each of them in their own individual unique ways, but also, um, you know, maybe allowed for a new kind of um, way of looking forward. And so this show, which has been in the, you know, planning stages for uh, over two years, um, opened this past weekend and we're just going to get on down to it. We're going to do a um, walkthrough, a virtual walkthrough of this show. And the first artist that we have here is uh, Tracy Featherstone. And uh, Tracy, I'd love to, we've worked together in the past, so I'm very familiar with your work, but I'd love to hear you talk more about these uh, two bodies of works for our guests. All right, hi everybody. Um, <laughs> it's hard to go first, but I guess, you know, you, Maria, you can follow up with some questions if um, I don't address what's, uh, you know, some of the important points you think you want me to bring up. So there's two, in the exhibition, there's like two textile pieces and then there's several smaller framed pieces. Um, and the textile pieces, I should maybe start by saying that I sort of had a, a environmental meltdown several years ago. I make a lot of work and um, I make big work usually. <laughs> and so um, I started doing a lot of ceramics and then um, realized that I wasn't able to sort of recycle the raw materials the way I was with wood and um, things like that. So I had a big shift in my practice. Like I re-examined the materials that I'm using and how I could do it better. And in fact, I'm also, um, taking over the printmaking program at Miami and we're transitioning that shop, the print shop into environmentally friendly practices as well. So it is pervasive in my practice and then also my teaching sort of thinking about, you know, as artists thinking about how we can improve and use materials in a more wise way. So um, the textile pieces in the middle are um, sort of conceptually based on this idea of, I went to I, um, snorkeling for the first time a couple of years ago and saw coral um, and it kind of blew my mind. But at the same time, I was very aware that as I'm seeing this like natural wonder that I'm also sort of destroying it at the same time um, by just you know being a person that's disturbing the ecosystem there. Um, 
so these pieces are kind of about the textile pieces are um, made from sort of recycled fabric and um, they are sort of about this idea of touch and um, sort of falling apart and mending and layering and um, sort of reusing these fabric to put something that's sort of disintegrating back together um, is kind of a general statement about those. And then the um, framed pieces uh, are sort of a different direction, but I was working on other works and I had like sort of this drop cloth underneath because I was using spray paint. And then when I lifted the actual piece I was making up, I realized there was some really interesting marks left behind as sort of a shadow from what I was working on. Um, so I took these pieces of paper, someone threw in the trash, <laughs> slipped them underneath the um, things that I was working on and continued to work. So it picked up this residue. And then I worked back into them um, with some stitching and drawing over top of those. And those pieces are called overspray. And a lot of times I um, find myself walking, especially in COVID through the neighborhood. And I'm really like, I have this collection of um, what I call drawings from the universe where you like are walking along the street and you see like the spray paint marks or the cracks in the sidewalk. And they're these really beautiful drawings that they're like these found drawings. And so I always think that the universe is sending me art and I collect pictures of all this stuff. So these overspray drawings remind me of kind of like the spray paint marks on the side of the street that happen when people are trying to mark utilities and things like that, these kind of found drawings. Was that a good introduction, Maria? <laughs> yeah, serendipity in all kind of uh, artistic encounters. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think. And I think I think a lot about cycles. So those, um, like this idea of disillusion and mending and coming back around, and also with the overspray drawings, this idea that one piece begets another piece begets another piece. Like I sort of find myself in these cyclical um, methods a lot. Like sort of when the um, the process leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing, and I think a lot about that um, in regards to sort of nature and natural processes too, cycles. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks just for having me and thanks for inviting me to um, join the show. It's an honor to be included in this nice group of people, artists, talented people. That's very sweet of you to say. No, I think I think the feeling's mutual. Um, do we have Carmen next? Yeah. And I think Herman's installation is just so powerful and um, I, I probably wouldn't do it justice. I'd, I'd love to hear from you, Carmen, in terms of um, what these symbols represent. We had a, a journalist in the gallery a couple of days ago interviewing me and um, specifically asked about the objects within the space. And I, I would love to hear from your point of view um, what they represent, what this, uh, this they symbolize in this mm. space. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, well, the work, as, as you know, is called Compound Effigy. And really, when I think about the layers of meaning and the layers of experiences that we have as human beings in our environment, particularly in a context of settler colonialism, where there are worlds built upon worlds and remnants of other realities that peek through and um, the, the settler eye imbues a different meaning on something. And yet what remains is a protocol for how to behave as human beings in this environment. So in the context of the work, you know, thinking globally, acting locally, as an artist that is not a person who lives in Columbus, you know, the fundamental question for me is, how can I offer something in my practice that's useful to the people who live in the place where they'll be viewing it? And so I came down to experience Columbus for the first time in many years and learned that there's a, um, a mound um, only about two miles from your gallery. Um, and yet the gallery is across the street from these kind of man-made contemporary objects 
that celebrate a story that erases the story of the people who buried their dead in the same space and place. And when I came down, there was a, a rally at the State House shortly after um, the election of Biden and Harris. And so I witnessed um, the fencing off of the street and the fencing off of uh, the State House because of the Proud Boys that were present. Um, and then I traveled to the mound and you know, discovered the ways in which it was contained um, by kind of monumental objects as well as an apartment complex across the street from it. And so the experience of, of being at the mound in, in a place of curiosity and reverence, uh, one of the objects that's in the installation is dried corn. And there was an offering of corn at the mound when I went to it. So literally what you're experiencing in the gallery is what I experienced when I visited the space um, uh, in, in, in person. Um, so it's an invitation, I think, for the viewer to think about reverence and what the protocols are, what the offerings are that's required um, as people wanting to, in a contemporary context, quote unquote, create a better world. We talk about creating a better world, but what does it mean to change a world that we don't quite understand? And so the layering of meaning around the work in the midst of me preparing uh, this project, the murder of Makia Bryant occurred on the same day as the Chauvin trial um, uh, results were released to the community. And so for me as a black and indigenous person, um, there is a mound of black bodies that continues to emerge in our community, but there are no protocols, there is no reverence, there is no offering. Um, and so I wanted this to be um, an offering to um, place and space and this moment of what does it mean for indigenous peoples who are displaced to continue um, to be, um, to continue to become a material for somebody else's viewing and use. Yeah. Really such a powerful um, site. It even, you know, it, it feels good in that in that room. I feel like you've you've uh, successfully been able to create a really sacred space for visitors. And thank you so much for your contribution. It, it's a I think a really important um, thing for us to to be thinking about right now. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, we have Kevin Harris uh, next, I believe. Uh, wonderful printmaker from uh, Dayton area and um, a longtime teacher at um, Sinclair Community College printmaker. Um, Kevin, you, we have your work throughout the gallery so that you have specific, a couple of specific walls, but then what I thought um, is, uh, you know, I, I hope of kind of that serendipitous experience for the visitor is that throughout uh, the gallery, we also have the bees um, as a kind of reminder, uh, consistent reminder of um, the, the themes that you're working with. So let me uh, stop talking and allow you to talk about your Thank you, Maria. And thank you for including me this, in this really intriguing and multi-sensory exhibition. Uh, I really appreciate the overall installation Cats crew put together. If you, I was able to go to the open house Saturday. It was wonderful. So if you haven't seen the exhibition in person, you get the chance, please do so because it is really fascinating experience. Um, the work is so diverse and it's really intriguing to find connections between the artists. I also want to thank all the other artists for the opportunity to exhibit alongside you. Um, my work, uh, the body of work presented here actually comes from multiple series of works that I use interchangeably. They are Fight, Fight or Fight, Angels Tread, and Dream Sequence. And this whole series grew out of a project I was involved in a few years ago that was organized by Dayton artist Bing Davis, where he invited artists to 
um, honor the efforts, honor the life of Dr. Martin Luther King with the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And you can interpret that, artists could interpret that any way they wanted to. I agreed to take part in the project and then I got really stuck to the point that I was gonna have to back out of it. And then all of a sudden it's, I just kept reading Dunbar things and I got kind of overwhelmed with that. I didn't realize how prolific the brother was when I got started, ordered like a volume of his book and it was like two volumes, like a thousand pages thick each. So then I got stuck again, but then things started coming together. And instead of just one piece, I ended up doing four different poems that I put together as one piece. So it was like a four in one piece. And that's where the background or the series of works dream sequence developed from. Coincidentally, the same time I was trying to figure out what to do, I attended two family reunions over the summer, one in Atlanta and one in Memphis. And some of the planned events, of course, were to visit important sites in King's life. So that gave me more fuel for my artwork. Out of that, one of the things I did was try to imagine um, King and Dunbar if they were young men living in the 21st century. If they were in their teens and 20s, how would society treat them? How would they deliver their message? For example, would uh, Dunbar be a lyricist? Well, how would King, would he be on the pulpit or would it be in the recording studio? And how they would be perceived and how what their lives would be like today. I ended up doing a piece uh, entitled Martin, which shows Martin Luther King in Trayvon Martin's hoodie. And when I would show the piece to people, they would say, oh, that's Trayvon Martin, just assuming taking the hoodie, the iconic hoodie, uh, making that assumption. I couldn't convince people it was King. They were so caught up at it being Trayvon Martin. So I did the companion piece on the right here to show Trayvon Martin wearing Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King's suit from his mugshot. In the image are bees and a black eyed Susan flower. The black eyed Susan is a symbol of judgment. It's interesting, I was trying to, looking at the work Maria selected, and I was trying to figure out the connections that she might've seen between them. And one thing I noticed with the exception of the bees, all the images showed children. NBQ on the left, Trayvon Martin on the right, the piece that deals with the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, and actually an international water crisis, Iba Deba Bear, which is on another wall. So those are actually, will actually be more pieces from the Angels Tread series. And fight or flight uh, for me deals with how, as a person of color, do you survive in this modern world? If you're, in, if you think the forces are against you, your instinct is to run or to fight. And either one of those in our society can get you killed. Uh, so you have to think about ways to remain calm. The pieces here on the left are Agua de Bear, a piece in the middle, a uh, piece next to that entitled Elegy for Mike, which is a reference to Mike Brown. And then eradication combines the bees and the cherubs uh, using the idea of being removed, erased, uh, distressed, and obfuscated in this imagery. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. it, it, difficult um, concepts, however, you know, relevant to our world, uh, clearly at this, uh, They've long been relevant. I think to some extent you're in connecting these historical uh, folks like Dr. Martin Luther King, like Paul Lawrence Dunbar with Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown. Um, we're seeing this ongoing uh, injustice. Um, and, I, and I think the work is deceptively beautiful, you know, despite the ugliness of the concept uh, and what and what themes you're working with. So thank you so much for the for the work in the show. I'm I'm very proud to have it included. Thanks so much. Uh, let's see where we we have Autumn next. Is that right? I think. which is the um, postcard image uh, is one of uh, Autumn's um, wonderful portraits, uh, which came out of the pandemic. Um, and do we have Autumn here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit more? This is several series that you um, were doing, you were photographing different kinds of folks and, and really sort of pivoted into the pandemics um, 
new normal. Um, gosh, I used like three different buzzwords there that I despise. Apologies to all of the audience. But nonetheless, I think it was really important kind of work. And if you could just give us a little background and maybe even, you know, we only have three minutes, but to tell us a little bit more about this beautiful series. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I am thrilled to be part of such a wonderful exhibition and happy to see it in person on Saturday. This all looks wonderful. Um, so this series is Portraits of a Pandemic. I started shooting during the stay at home order. I was capturing um, essential workers and people staying at home. So I picked the essential workers in a black and white, more of a lower, lower angle, a lot more fall off and make it more about this person who has been stripped of any other identity other than their job. Um, in contrast, the stay at home series is in color, a little bit wider, you get a little more personality, a little more depth into the, the person's life. And I was quickly seeing how this was such a huge contrast. Now, <clears throat> the plan was to finish shooting in May and when the COVID numbers went down and, and things started to go back to normal, but as we know, the pandemic evolved and so did this project. So, I made it much more expansive as things changed. Um, what does a central worker, what does that mean when everybody goes back to work? Um, so I shifted from what the state deemed essential to what we deemed essential. So in May through, May through August, I did a bigger push on just advocacy, Black Lives Matter, a lot of, um, a lot of equal rights campaign Things that never went away were front lines and food pantry. Um, when we got into the fall semester and schools started having to make their own decisions on who was going to open and how that was going to work. I featured, you know, um, a principal. I featured people uh, voting, voting advocates. I think we have one in their protect your vote campaign. Um, and I think the selections of the Actually, there's what's interesting. There's one in there of a um, Colombian internal medicine physician, and she she has a she has a big share. But since she was <clears throat> the only resident who was bilingual, she, and she had to be the person who spoke with the families, um, every single family, as before she was finished with the residency, before people got intubated, um, it was it was hard hearing some of these stories and. It was great hearing some of these stories. Um, I met many people. I photographed um, over 650 people now. Uh, here we have, I think we have 20 or 17 pieces uh, and it continues. So it's, it's ongoing, but it's been good. Thank you. Yeah, and that the the photo that's on the uh, postcard, Ben and Kate, the, the mask enthusiast, I think is a, uh, could you tell us just maybe like a for a second what your experience with them was because I think you know we're seeing so many this is a subject that's coming up again right um that so um how how did you encounter them what was the experience so again this this was just um it kind of it just expanded a lot I had um this person photographed and then they said, oh, you, you should really photograph these people. So that's kind of like through three different people got connected with this family. These young kids, um, they're, in, they're in their primary age. I think she's, I don't know, they're like I think five and seven. Um, but the funny thing is, is they, they are mask collectors. They, they get excited about new masks. They're always showing them off. They kind of compare and, you know, like how siblings would kind of argue over who gets which one and when I heard that about them, I said, oh my gosh, let's get some photos of you two in your mask because this has been a hot topic, the entire pandemic really putting children in masks. Um, and, and this actually raised a great conversation about how there are children who are excited at thinking of it like ex any accessories. So it, it kind of, I kind of kept trying to find this silver lining in everybody's life um, to help, help us all stay connected and relate um, but yeah, that's their story, Ben and Kate's story. Yeah, and there, there's there's a lot of stories behind all of these uh, photos. I think there's a there's a tenderness with which you uh, portray your sitters that I think is difficult with through photography or any lens based work. But thank you for your contribution to the show. I'm I'm proud to have it in the in shift. 
I think we have um, Lauren Davies next. Hi. Um, Thank you so much, Maria, for including me in this exhibition. And it was wonderful to get to finally meet you in person on yeah. Saturday at the open house, along with uh, some of the other artists who were there. So um, briefly about my work, um, I feel like shift the title of the exhibition really pertains to my work and my life of the last quite a number of years. Um, I uh, grew up in the Rust Belt and moved to California and uh, to go to school and stayed there for about 35 years. And a series of um, things, you know, financial, family sort of things um, made it um, most practical for me to move to Cleveland, um, where I had not grown up. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and uh, the only people I knew in Cleveland were my family, which was why I moved here. But when I got here, um, I really felt like I was at a personal crossroads of re-examining my life. I really thought about just giving up on being an artist. Uh, but what I did instead was really changed my practice. And it wasn't like initially a really super specific thought, but it, it became part of a, a re-examination of growing up in the Rust Belt. And I felt in a way that I was really forced out of San Francisco due to the, like for most artists who lived out there, many people, uh, the tech economy just, you know, just crushed normal life out there. So coming back to the Rust Belt and looking at everything that had happened since I left Pittsburgh, it was really amazing just for me to spend time um, driving around and, and really looking at the impact um, the economy, the history of the economy in the region had left its mark on, like I would say on architecture and also in the landscape. So part of my personal artistic shift became um, becoming more involved in photography, which was not something I had done before. I'd been working in sculpture. So I have found a way that kind of shifted my focus, my practice in a way that encompassed all these things I was really interested in, the history of the region, my personal connection to having grown up in the Rust Belt of, of combining photography with research, with kind of like a hands-on, almost like craft making um, kind of work that is actually um, also created through Walmart, which is another whole facet of um, the economy now, of looking at all of this manufacturing, the remains of what had been manufacturing and all the lives that revolved around that and how that has been you know, superseded many times over now by technology. So it was a way to connect um, kind of like images of the past using technology, you know, contemporary technology. So, um, you know, most of the, you know, most, I mean, all of the images are shot around in the Rust Belt. And the two images that are in the center of uh, the screen that's up right now are actually, um, from a prison that probably many of you have visited, the one in Mansfield. Um, so I've thought a lot of that place uh, really has a very heavy presence of how history resides in architecture. So that's kind of part of a new shift I'm working on um, in this ongoing series. It's looking at the, the prisons. Yeah, and I think they're, they're not, um simple answers that I think your work is looking for. Perhaps not that not that artwork has to give answers, but I think that uh, when dealing with a lot of kind of loaded concepts, I think it's it's difficult to get that nuance of ideas and uh, questions that uh, your work really stirs up um, in viewers because they are beautiful works um, and they feel photographic, but they also feel sculptural. Um, and so uh, I think, yeah, sorry, I'm getting the message that we are at time. Um, so I should stop talking. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, Lauren, for sharing your work uh, with uh, Rife Gallery visitors. I think it's, it's beautiful and important. And, Speaking of beautiful and important, Terrence Hammond's uh, work, which is up on the screen right now. Um, 
Terrence is an artist who I've also worked with uh, in the past. I'm just such a fan of the, the new work, especially is just so incredible. If you could tell us a little bit about um, this new body of work. First, I want to say thanks so much for including me in this exhibition, which so many amazing artists doing such great work. Yeah. Um, the piece that's in the forefront is um, you've got to get up to get down. Um, and it is a dance floor. Um, and it's basically, um, strangely enough, uh, a love letter to uh, my mother as a young adult. These are photos um, that were happening in the world um, from the time that she graduated uh, high school to the time that she had her first child, um, which is I think a, like about 21, it's my older sibling. Um, and in that time is the end of hippies, it's uh, sort of the end of the civil rights movement um, and, uh, and um, uh, just it really it's a homage to radical thought. Um, dance is a huge part of uh, my, my life and music is a huge part of um, my practice as well. Um, and if we can go to the pieces on the wall, uh, those are called, uh, they're entitled, The Beat Will Always Save Us. And um, as the dance floor has images of sort of, of black pain and of struggles, uh, I think this, uh, this work wants to celebrate uh, the, the radical uh, act of, of joy and um, and really celebrate that. Um, during the, the height of the pandemic, um, my family and I were, I have, I'm the parent of two small children and my wife and I uh, will have dance parties with the kids every night. And then so much so with our family that were um, scattered all over the country, we would have Skype dance parties. And uh, so uh, to me, just the simple act of dancing with someone you love or even by yourself um, really uh, is becomes a sort of emotional reset. Um, it is a way of transporting you back into um, different times, different eras. It's a, uh, I think dance floors are this amazing place where culture is exchanged. Um, so really all this work is sort of a uh, love letter to all of that. Thank you so much. It's just, uh, uh, I think I included your quote um, when you were writing about it to me, that it was a, a love letter to black joy that was so big, it deserves its own orbit. Just even thinking it, it like gives me goosebumps because I think it's it's literally the kind of, of imagery that I think the world deserves right now. We need to see that more black joy in the world. So thank you so much, Terrence. Um, it's really therapeutic for me to make that work, uh, especially when you know every day you're inundated with uh, images of poor Elijah McLean or all these horrible uh, black pain that um, I wanted to create these sort of, I mean, in my home, they function like family heirlooms. Uh, so we can all sort of think about black joy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Right. What do we got next? We have Danielle. Is that or is it Ha next? I'm trying to think of what order we're going in. We can go to either. Looks like Ha. Hey everyone. Um so that piece is called Death Rose Repeat. Um it's a terracotta um grave site and so my practice is a lot about the unlearning of assimilation and thinking about how like a physical body is seen in a dom dominant public sphere of whiteness and privately within itself. Um, as like a child who is an immigrant growing up in the 90s, um, like I learned a lot about American culture through TV. And one of the things was Chia Pets. And so I've somehow I've always been interested in um, materiality. And so I use 
um, you know, the chia as a way to sprout growth, but also in collaboration with a established institution, in this case, a white wall gallery. So it's a collaboration between myself and a space in which I don't have control over. So it's like a accepting lack of control. Um, and so if they grow, and in this case, they did grow, um, they're very abundant. Um, they go through their life cycle while on display. So they'll also be, um, they, I germinate them, they're growing, they're also going to die in the space as well. And I use terracotta thinking about the hierarchy of materiality as this. So terracotta is seen as this like perceived lesser material to porcelain in a way of thinking about the value of whiteness. And the terracotta tombstones sit in these concrete basins, the material that's really prevalent in, in spaces of, you know, quote unquote, developed modernality. And we walk all over concrete and we occupy buildings that are created from it. And we take for granted the cost of this widely used material. Um, like the concrete, the concrete industry it especially harms people who work with it, as well as our environment as this like primary producer of carbon dioxide, um, along with other toxic health concerns um, of workers inhaling the silica when they're when they're working with it. And so those basins that atop these tile pedestals that I think a lot about like bathrooms as a space for cleansing oneself. So I'm this composition and these materials are thinking about like both a personal but also like a public abstract narrative of how we perceive death and our desire for taming the uncontrollable um, through these through creating this monumental form um, that will one day crumble but also thinking about like who is subjected to more deaths you know um, especially given what we've seen this last year i think we can grow from um, we can definitely grow from what has happened and being attuned to the hierarchies of power as well as materiality of it. Um, so yeah, thank you, Maria, for including me into this wonderful group of very talented artists. It's been a pleasure, Ha. Huh? Thank you for your important work. Yeah, I think there's so much great work in the show. I know I'm very biased, but um, you're gonna hear me say that literally over and over this entire um, hour. So um, thanks to thanks to all of the artists for working with these uh, heavy subjects. I think we have Danielle Julian Norton um, up next. Uh, so as that's loading, um, I know Danielle, you show a lot, you've shown a lot this past year, and this is a little bit of a deviation from your more typical kind of um, larger oversized installation. So if you um, can give us a little bit of a background on yeah. this. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, my name is Danielle Julian Norton, and I live and work in Columbus and teach at Columbus College of Art and Design. And I'm yeah, really delighted to be a part of such a great exhibition and meet all these great artists in the show. Um, my, uh, this is, I guess, as close to a painting as I've gotten. <laughs> um, and the past work was dealing with um, plants and thinking about them metaphorically as uh, community caretaking and acts of healing. Um, and so, although there aren't any live plants in this piece. Um, and the work usually is uh, humorous, um, kind of absurd, but I have said this many times, but I, you know, I take that really seriously as a pushback against social norms, which I think is really important. Um, and, you know, politically driven. Um, and that's through the materials and the objects that are chosen here, uh, like the mushroom, which is, uh, something I've gotten really into is mushroom hunting, but also just as a love of doing it. But I think it's something that's paid less attention to. It's a recycler um, and this kind of underground communication system through object. Um, and uh, it's essential for the plants to grow. Um, and the use of this, the, the piece is titled um, Two Broken Arms and a Spider. And the spider, which is kind of that form on the right, um, 
I've always loved something that stayed in my brain was um, Louise Bourgeois talking about her mother as a spider and how fierce um, and protective and kind of scary, but awesome, you know, this, um, and um, so, yeah, that's a little, and the use of materials also in the beads. And I think about politically patriarchy and a hierarchy through just materials quite a bit. Um, and so the use of just this small bead, which is something that my mom makes, um, but that is a kind of push back onto um, just materials and how we see them and how they're valued. Um, but metaphorically, <laughs> you know, thinking about that in a metaphorical way. And it's the clay that's here is from the ground, Ohio clay, it's, um, and was also fired up at Seneca Tile. So that kind of club-like piece is a petrified tree that I found with my daughter um, and uh, Ohio clay from the ground that was um, shaped and fired in, fired at a kiln in Ohio. Um, so, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, this, this particular work, I think, rewards uh, close inspection and that kind of um, taking the time to look um, and to see, which I think is, was also maybe part of the process for either gathering some of these objects or creating the, the objects. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is. I, I feel like, um, I mean, these objects were also objects that I made in such a, I mean, it, it was obviously a strange time, but I was making them alongside with my students. Um, and I also view that as like a political, um, just to be um, talking to students from like rural Ohio and working alongside with, of them and like making these things and also this kind of uh, back and forth, like learning between, you know, so these were objects made over the last year and a half, um, kind of working alongside with students. Thank you, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lorena, we have Lorena Molina next um, to talk about her installation. Another plant-based installation. Um, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, just different pieces, uh, what the different pieces in the exhibition installation mean, and just give you some historical background. Um, and I promise I time myself in this three minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, so in the last few years, I've been using or repeating different objects or symbols to discuss topics of war, displacement, and what a home in the margin looks like, especially as a person that has been displaced from her homeland because of war. And this piece at the ship exhibition does this. Um, I also want to clarify some comments that were made during the curatorial walkthrough. Um, this piece is not about a playful memory or my mother and I playing fort. Uh, this piece was um, talks about a time that my mother created a fort during the Salvadoran um, Civil War to protect us from harm during La Ofensiva, which was a few days during the war that the guerrilla came down from the mountains where most of the uh, combat was happening to try to take over the government and the cities in Salvador. Uh, they populated different neighborhoods, mine and Soyapango being one of them. Um, and their plan was to get into people's homes for protection, but also to try to recruit them to help them fight the Salvadoran government. Um, the government knew this, so they attacked people's homes as well. Um, so civilians were stuck in the middle of the combat as many times they are during war. Um, and so my mother made a fort as an attempt to protect us from the combat, and this bed piece uh, represents this uh, memory um, the raspberries are growing from the mattress. I have used raspberries before in my work um, as a symbol of rooting and belonging since raspberries take two years to bear fruit. And I had my first, first raspberry when I moved to the United States. Um, and the raspberries for me are always wishful thinking. They're a sign of wishful thinking for belonging and safety. Just like my mother used the bed for protection, for protection was. And I find like there's this really uh, interesting push and pull between the mattress and the hopefulness of the raspberries, since the mattress represents uh, the facade of safety because uh, the mattress could have actually not protected us from danger. Um, also, there's like, I don't know if you can see it, but the bed is sprinkled with red clay, which I have used before in my work before to discuss war crimes 
caused by U.S. imperialism, such as el, en el mozote. Um, and, and while I'm on the topic of that, like, um, it has to be mentioned that the war in El Salvador lasted 12 years because the U.S. helped fund it by sending one to two million dollars daily to make it ex an example to other countries and to keep a U.S. friendly government in power. Um, so because of this, you see there's two screens and they have a rot two rotating GIFs that display the words, do you feel safe, do you feel free? And they flash almost like a neon advertisement, um, asking the viewer to think about their preconceived ideas about safety and freedom, as well as freedom and safety for whom, uh, and the price that even children had to pay uh, with their lives during the years um, a war fought by the United States under the facade of safety and freedom. In my case, a child had to cover for safety under a mattress for the freedom and safety we celebrate in this country. Thank you, Lorena. I'm sorry if I misrepresented your, um, any sort of feeling or moods too lightly in the curatorial tour. Um, I think sometimes the job of the arts administrator um, is often to make things palatable. And unfortunately, this is a, a very difficult to, you know, take um, storyline because of the precarity of your experience and the vulnerability of your experience. I apologize if I at all um, misspoke, misrepresented the importance and the profundity of this moment. All right, so we have Amber J. Anderson next. Hi, this is uh, Amber J. Anderson. Uh, I wanna thank you, Maria, for including me in this exhibition. Um, it's been such an honor and I really enjoyed seeing the work of the other artists in person last week. Um, so my work is definitely 100% pandemic. Uh, <laughs> focused. Um, as so many of us experienced, the pandemic um, really kind of upended our lives in, in many different ways. And um, for me as cultural producer and the changes in the, in the arts, um, I suddenly found myself with a lot of time on my hands and a lot of time to think and kind of retreat mentally inside. And a poem that kept going through my head. Um, a, a lot of my work is um, reflective of uh, literature and a poem by Emily Dickinson was kind of on repeat at, at the beginning of the pandemic when I was stuck in my house. Um, and the opening line of that poem uh, is, one need not be a chamber to be haunted. One need not be a house. The brain has corridors surpassing material place. Um, and just thinking about how the real ghosts are not the ghosts that um, we would see in a house, but the ghosts that are in our own minds. Um, so I was uh, thinking about houses and I had been collecting these uh, vintage house kits. Um, and so I decided to pull those out and take a stab at constructing them. Uh, they're all Victorian houses, and I think when you think of kind of the archetype of the haunted house, the first thing you're going to think of is, is a big foreboding Victorian house. Um, and so I, I, I know I'm on, on, on screen, but I did kind of do a man behind the curtain. Here's one of the houses. Um, and just so I was thinking about the Emily Davidson or the Emily Dickinson poem building the houses. And then another one of my fav favorite authors, uh, Susanna Clark, released a book called Paranasi, which is a book about a man who is stuck in a large house full of endless corridors. And rather than feeling trapped um, by this house, he feels embraced and loved by the house. And he feels that the house is nurturing him and the house provides everything that he needs. So why would he want to leave the house? Um, so I started thinking about houses and being trapped in the house and I'm building the houses and <laughs> I am haunting the houses myself um, mentally because uh, my mental state is haunted because of the pandemic. And um, just thinking about 
you know, I think self-care is kind of an overused phrase right now. Um, but thinking about it's okay to, to take care of yourself. It's okay to be haunted. It's okay to want to escape into art or into literature and take care of yourself. And um, yeah, so these are houses I have haunted during the pandemic and you should haunt them too. Awesome. Thanks, Amber. It's great work. I think we can all really relate to being uh, stuck inside and, and maybe even creating our own sort of fantasy, fantasy experience um, throughout the course of the past year. And maybe who knows the way things are going, um, maybe we'll be doing that more again soon. Um, which leaves us with Alison Crescetta, um, our 11th uh, artist in shift. Um, I know that this was a, a, a challenge, uh, you know, as a performance artist. Um, so I would love to hear your, you discuss this open channel experience. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Allison Crosetta. I also uh, live here in Columbus and I teach at OSU. And um, as Maria said, I do a lot of performance work uh, it's kind of a full circle thing to Tracy in the beginning when she talked about having a little bit of a meltdown moment with um, looking at her um, work and the kind of environmental impact of her practices. Um, I, three years ago, had a big exhibition that is the kind of show that you sort of dream about having. Um, it was amazing. And it left me really questioning the carbon footprint of my own work in the world. And um, kind of, I came to a full stop for the first time in many years. I just stopped for a while. Uh, I stopped long enough to really ask myself, how did I wanna show up in the world? And so that process began before pandemic times and before uh, everything that's been going on. Um, you know, and being sort of brought up in recent, in the last year and a half, say, or longer. Um, and so when I was invited to be in the show, we were all basically still on lockdown in our homes. And I started to think about, I went down there fully masked to the gallery, walked around and started to imagine that basically the kinds of work I might offer durational performance or something like that really wasn't something that I thought would be too viable. And I really was thinking a lot also about these times that we're living through and what is it that we're supposed to be doing as artists? How are we supposed to be showing up? And maybe for me, this was an opportunity to really offer something different from my, from possible things that I could give. And uh, one of the things that I have been very in, informed by and practicing for years now is something called Reiki. Um, and so part of that is uh, the ability to send what's called distanced Reiki. And so actually the image that's on the wall in the gallery is really a placeholder. Uh, it's kind of a, it's just something that brings you close enough, hopefully to look at the QR code and actually go to the gallery. Uh, and perhaps we can put the link to the QR code um, uh, even in the chat if we have it, but um, the bottom line is that what I'm doing is I'm offering Reiki sessions, which is a, a healing modality, and um, they're one-on-one -on -one individual sessions, and anyone on this call who might be interested in receiving some Reiki energy, um, I can offer that from my home to wherever you are, and it doesn't matter if you're in Columbus or if you're in Columbia, um, you can be anywhere in the world and um, I can offer this energy. I've been around it for more than 20 years and practicing it for several years now. And so I'll be giving an artist talk about the other work that I've made and then continuing to make um, on September 1st. And I think I'll just end it there. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. And I just want to say it's really an incredible group of artists and 
Maria, thank you for your patience. And also want to say thank you for being open to an, to an idea as um, sort of unconventional as open channel. Thanks. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's great. And that's what hopefully we're all sort of moving through new ways of being, new ways of living, right? When those crises happen is when paradigm shifts can occur, I think. And just the mere fact that I think all of you have had shifts in your own practice um, and, um, you know, shifts in hopefully prioritization, you know, not just on a professional level and on a personal level, you know, I think that none of us can escape um, the uh, context that we've been living in, which is overwhelming and um, also hopefully, I think filled with hope uh, and potential. Um, so yeah, Amy put the uh, Reiki sign up uh, jot form link in the chat for any of our viewers. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. Uh, thank you to the Rife Gallery. Um, we have lots of artist talks involved in this um, exhibition, which you can find on the Rife Gallery's Eventbrite. Um, I'm sure Kat can give all the details, but um, thank you again to, oh, I'm sorry, Carmen, did you wanna say something? Yeah, before we, before we closed, I just wanted to acknowledge the significance of the work and that we're having this conversation on the one year uh, anniversary of the explosion at the port of Beirut. And so in the context of, you know, thinking globally and acting locally, you know, I'd like to at least kind of dedicate our work together to our relatives globally and whose relatives um, locally live in our communities and are impacted by this day. Thank you so much, Carmen. It's important. Absolutely. Yes, huge thank you to um, Maria for putting this phenomenal group of artists together. Um, thank you to the artists that showed up as your very best selves and put phenomenal work into this exhibition. Um, the Rife Gallery exists as a part of the Ohio Arts Council so that we can amplify your phenomenal voices. Um, we do have a great lineup of programming that you can check out at rifegallery.eventbrite.com. You can also view any and all of our digital archive, which includes 360 tours and um, great images of artwork at our gallery, rifegallery.org sorry, our website, rifegallery.org. Um, so thank you to everyone that has tuned in and will tune in. Um, and thank you always to the OAC board, the governor and the legislature who allow for this space to exist. Uh, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye.